It is my pleasure today to welcome uh, Dr. Katrin Cesarski uh, as part of this speaker series. Um, that's, I mean, Katrin kindly accepted the invitation for today. And today, as you know, coincides with the International Day of Women and Girls in Science. So her talk will touch upon this, uh, this important aspect of, of diversity and in particular gender diversity in science. So I'm sure this will inspire uh, a, number of, uh, a number of people out there. Um, and of course, of course, this talk is very timely as well because uh, Catherine, uh, Dr. Cesarski, as, uh, as you will know, after being chair of the SK organization uh, board of directors for over three years, she was elected last week first, uh, first chair of the SKO council. Uh, and being first is actually a trend in uh, Catherine's uh, long and very fruitful career. Uh, and, and she's actually been a trailblazer in many respects, as you will find out through the, the presentation that she will give. Uh, being first in a number of occasions. Uh, so the first woman to run a European research organization uh, as ESO Director General, the first woman president of the IAU, uh, and the first and until now the only woman to be a high commissioner for the French government. So Dr. Cesarski has not only held numerous prestigious positions internationally, uh, she's also a, you know, an accomplished astronomer uh, and she has published over 150 refereed papers spanning across several areas of astrophysics from the high energy domain uh, in, uh, in your early career, uh, Catherine, to the infrared uh, a bit later. And uh, Catherine has received a large number of awards and distinctions in recognition for such a brilliant and unique career. Um, and for instance, I should stay, say that in France, uh, Catherine also holds the very prestigious title of uh, Grand Officier de la Légion d'Honneur, uh, the Légion d'Honneur being the highest order of uh, merit in the country. So that's uh, all very impressive. So I could go on and on, you know, uh, as Catherine's credentials are very impressive, but, uh, you know, you don't want to hear me speak. So enough talking. And so now I'm happy to give, to give you the floor, Catherine. So over to you. Thank you very much, William. <clears throat> so hello, everybody. I wish I could be with you. And I do my best in front of my computer as I have been for so long now. So, as I said, because it is, as uh, William has said, because it is this International Day of Women in Science, I decided to give a different kind of talk and open up on my personal experience as a woman scientist. Of course, of a generation earlier than most of you, so things have changed. But, so I tell you the history of my life, but it's a little bit personal sometimes. Uh, so the early years, I was born in France, but I was raised in Buenos Aires, Argentina, where my parents moved. I attended a French school, and you can see my class when I was like 13 years old, I'm the one here in red. And we had to specialize in the last year, I was 16, and I was the first girl in the school to specialize in math science. All the girls always stayed away from that. And we were 11 in my class, and I was at the top of the class. Very clearly, because we finished with this baccalaureate, and I was way ahead of everybody. So once and for all, I knew that men are not necessarily better than women in math and science. So this has been an extremely useful experience. What was my dream at the time? To put nature in equations. I wanted to do theory, and at the same time, was very attracted by nature. So naturally, I went to physics. I studied physics in Buenos Aires University, and I got married there after I finished. And uh, later, my husband and I, and actually here I show a picture when we received our diploma from the Buenos Aires University, six of us, the friends I was always working with, and this one is my husband, Diego Cesarski. So this is why I'm called Cesarski. Um, and, um, you see, I'm of a generation where one uses the husband's name. I think, uh, I hope women don't do this anymore. I certainly wouldn't do it now. And uh, so uh, we were very lucky that we obtained uh, the possibility to go to Harvard and do a PhD there, which we both passed in 1971. So the first part of my career was in equations. That's what I had decided I wanted to do. And in particular, my thesis, my PhD thesis at Harvard, 
passed in 1971, was called Interactions of Cosmic Rays with Hydromagnetic Waves in the Galaxy. And in it, I uh, looked for cosmic ray propagation due to and the effect of resonant interactions with hydromagnetic waves and the effect of the waves degenerated themselves. I showed that this cannot be the dominant mechanism. I introduced uh, the uh, interactions with the turbulence in the interstellar medium and uh, the effect that this also had of heat in the interstellar medium, etc. So these were at the time very, very new ways of looking at this problem. So I must say my thesis was very well received and this is how I got. Um, well, first of all, uh, in 1970, I went uh, for the first time to present a paper in an international conference. You can see how late, and it was in La Paz in Bolivia. And uh, I have this picture, which I like very much. This was in Bolivia. This was the president of Bolivia. So we were received at a very high level. And uh, this is me. The person here is Satyo Hayakawa, who was one of the two most famous people in cosmic ray theory at the time in the world. And so I had a fantastic opportunity to meet him and talk to him. And he was very encouraging and impressed by my thesis. So uh, that also was a big help. Well, in the night, there was a lot of noise. On the following day, this man was not anymore the president of Bolivia, but we caught him just on time. And you can see another few very well-known people here. I can't name that all, but I feel like naming this one because this is Juan Roederer. Oh, sorry. Well, never mind. Um, I have to go back. Um, who was my professor of the first physics courses in Buenos Aires. And I was very, then he moved uh, to Alaska and I was very happy to meet him there again. Okay. So, uh, so I got, and both my husband and I got offers to be postdoc at Caltech. You can see how lucky we were. And at Caltech, the excitement on science and research was very high. I learned a lot. I had an excellent time. My sponsor was Peter Goldrash, one of the biggest uh, astrophysicists of the 20th century or, and of now. And I had lots of discussions with him, even though in the end we did nothing together. There were extremely few women on campus, only one other postdoc over the whole campus. She was in chemistry. And the uh, girls had started coming as, undergrad as undergraduates, I think it was the second year. So we created a group of support for women on campus and they all came to my house actually <laughs> uh, once a week. And well, we did a lot about the situation of women in circles like this with very few women. And while I was at Caltech, I had my first son in 1972. And of course the first reaction of the director was to want to fire me, but uh, they didn't, but I had no maternity leave. And in general, a very good time. In 1974, we moved to France. And I joined a laboratory which is involved in space research. At the time, it was run by a woman. So that already made it easy. Very few women in the group, but the head was a woman. And there was a theory group. And soon I became head of the theory group, 11 people. And I did much work on cosmic ray propagation and acceleration and on the interstellar medium and other topics. In 1979, I had my second son in much easier circumstances. And uh, I had to write a paper for annual review of astronomy and astrophysics, which is a very prestigious um, series that uh, is made in the US. And I must say, when I received the, the letter inviting me to write a review for that, I felt I'm not forgotten. You know, I left the US, but I'm not forgotten because it's very American. And uh, it was a high point in my life. And since I had the baby and was at home, well, I, I wrote the paper at that time. So cosmic ray confinement in the galaxy. Lovely to write it and have the baby, I must say. And write it, I wrote by hand at the time. So this was the start of my career in France. So my organization is called CEA and uh, my office is at Saclay, which still is my office at Saclay. So I did a lot of uh, theoretical work on cosmic rays, which I will, of course, not read to you, but <laughs> I put some of the points to show you. Um, 
And I must say, uh, my work was very well received and I really achieved a lot of recognition in these early years as a theorist in cosmic rays. And I also did the first science case for the Pierre Roger Observatory, which now exists, you know, but, and I also did a science case for a space instrument of Ulysses because my laboratory was essentially a laboratory building space instruments. You know, the theory group was like a small appendix, but the important thing was to build instruments. So now we go to the second part of my career centered on satellites. So as I told you, uh, I wrote uh, the science case to have an instrument on Ulysses and this convinced uh, uh, the selection committee and uh, we had an instrument on Ulysses. And so I got really interested in uh, um, more in space itself. I also had been invited to be a member of the astronomy working group at ESA which made me hear about all the other space projects in Europe. And I had, a, I wanted very much to see Europe climb scientifically. You know, I came from the best places in the, in the United States, Harvard, Caltech, Princeton, because my, my PhD actually was with a Princeton professor. And uh, I felt that, that Europe could climb to this level, but it had to. So I, I and one of the ways was of course, to do very well in space astrophysics in really uh, difficult projects. So I got involved in that. Uh, I have been uh, involved uh, in an instrument on SOHO. I have been uh, involved uh, quite a bit in XMM and in one instrument on XMM. So in COI of these, I've been COI of an instrument in Cassini because uh, of the infrared detectors that they used that I had developed. And I was also involved in starting uh, what later became the Planck uh, mission. In the end, I was only scientific associate for Planck because I got involved in other things. And the same with Integra. I was also scientific associate, but my main involvement was in ISO, the Infrared Space Observatory. Um, and this is because I was very interested in it, I started uh, um, organizing the French community to build an instrument for ISO. And this was the camera, ISOCAM. And uh, when the moment came to finish, people were so happy with my organization that even though I was a theorist, they asked me to be the PI. And nobody, you know, they all said nobody else could be the PI and I jumped from <laughs> theorist to PI of a space instrument. By the way, I was the first woman to be PI of an ESA instrument. And uh, at the time, uh, the head of the laboratory was not this lady anymore, it was a man, uh, was leaving and uh, the CEA offered me to become the director of our laboratory, about 150 people. And uh, I accepted because it gave me the possibility to really get within the laboratory all the uh, effort I needed to be able to build ISOCA. So it was a complete change of life working not only with scientists, but also with engineers and technicians, something I have learned to like very, very, very much. Um, and of course, then uh, doing management. Uh, so I did still some theory on the side for several years, but um, very different life. So ISO in the, in the end was launched in 1995. And uh, ISO was the second infrared uh, satellite uh, dedicated to astronomy. The first one had been IRAS. IRAS had done the whole sky, um, but uh, with a relatively low accuracy and uh, low sensitivity. For instance, the famous Whirlpool galaxy seen by IRAS was the blur you see here. ISOCAM was a precursor instrument. We were, it was the first time that they were array detectors uh, infrared in space, but you know how large our detectors were? 32 by 32 pixels. So you would laugh, you would laugh now, but it was really important. And uh, when the satellite was launched and it was possible to remove the cover of the telescope, the first image was taken with ISOCAM. And this is the first image. And it was centered on the Whirlpool Galaxy. And it's a little piece of the Whirlpool Galaxy. And you see, we could see 
the spiral structure of M51. So it was a moment of great joy. And uh, uh, later on, this is the image that uh, Isocam could give of the World Cool Galaxy, the first image of this galaxy in infrared. I thought because we are on this Women's Day, it was interesting to tell you something more about the ISOCAM team. So on the top, you see a picture of part of the ISOCAM team. You see a mixture of men and women as, as usual. Um, and below, you see another picture, which is some of the ladies in the group. And it is important because in the ISOCAM uh, team, you know, of course, I was the PI, and I chose a project manager, Daniel Ambo, a woman, sorry. <clears throat> a woman. And uh, we had a very big contract, which was in Aerospatial. And when at Aerospatial, they saw Daniel and I arrive, negotiate with them this contract. They had an idea. They also had a push to put women somewhere. So for once, they put a woman in charge of a project. And this is Daniel Oterno. So you can say uh, the two Daniels and I were sort of running at least the construction part of the project. Nineteen five arrived, it was launched, and when the first image arrived, I went to Villa Franca, ISA, where the data were arriving. So here I am showing this first image that you just saw. Um, and as you can see, no more women here. <laughs> so here you see a mixture of my team and the team that ISA had formed around ISOCAM, which was led by Leo Metcalf here. And in my team, of course, there were also many in important positions. Uh, uh, François Sibyl as project scientist, uh, Laurent Vigrou uh, as instrument scientist. So the two of them were extremely important. And my husband, Diego, was also involved uh, in uh, part of the software to talk with the instruments. So he had to be there also to make sure that everything was working OK. So with ISOCAM, it was possible for the first time to peer in south clouds of gas and dust where stars had been formed. We were looking at the, this is a invisible light, the region of Rho Fuki, one of the closest dark clouds from our solar system. And you can see in the visible, what you see is dark region. But with ISOCAM, you see that there are lots of things inside, and uh, studies could be done on uh, star formation on these and many other clouds, which again were completely precursors of what has been done since then, but opened a lot of fields and uh, opened a lot of uh, windows on star formation in clouds. Then another thing that we did with ISOCAM is uh, we did deep surveys, medium surveys, shallow surveys to be able to, uh, to count uh, and to see the distribution of infrared sources uh, in the sky. And we also could go to uh, make a very deep survey of what was the very hot item of the time, the Hubble Deep Field. So here you see the Hubble deep field as it was seen in the optical. I'm sure the astronomers among you have seen this picture a zillion of times. And the yellow and green things here are what Isocam could see. The yellow are 15 microns and the green are 7 microns. And as you can see, we could see quite a few of these sources. And of course, it was very good because uh, um, that allowed us to know the, the distance to these sources thanks to the optical data and uh, to know more about them. And then uh, we also did what is called source count, simply counting the number of sources uh, fainter and fainter. You know, we were two orders of magnitude more sensitive than IRAS, so uh, we could go, of course, much further. And if uh, the density of infrared sources had been the same far away in the universe, as it is here, then we would have found a curve like this. And instead, as you could see, we found that as we went to fainter and fainter sources, they were like 10 times more sources than that. And so it was the first uh, demonstration that there were many more infrared sources, many more infrared galaxies in the past than now in the galaxy. 
And from this, uh, this led to uh, many studies uh, in my group and of course all over the world uh, of galaxy evolution. It has become a very, very, very big topic. And uh, um, in particular in my group in Saclay, we have a very, very strong team in this field uh, with uh, uh, people like David Albaz uh, and Emanuele Dadi. And uh, the, the picture today is that uh, indeed the galaxies in the past were very luminous in the infrared because they had a lot more star formation than they have now, uh, partly because they have much more gas and so they don't have to be the result of a collision between galaxies, but simply because in principle they have a lot of gas. And if they have a lot of gas, we have to try to understand where is this gas coming from. So I'm telling you this because I will come back to this later in the talk. Um, when extrapolated to the far infrared, we found that the radiation of these mid infrared galaxies is the one that produces the cosmic infrared background. At our wavelengths, we could see the bulk of the galaxies doing the cosmic infrared background. In 1998, I attended the COSPAR General Assembly in Nagoya, and I received the COSPAR Space Science Award um, as a mixture of my work on cosmic rays, and uh, which of course was a big topic for COSPAR, and uh, my uh, work in infrared uh, space astronomy. So this prize is given every two years to CT4, and that year they decided to give it to women, so I shared it with another woman, Marcia Nogebau. They waited until 2012 to give it to a woman again, and none since. <laughs> and I must say I am now uh, in the board, and we are looking at ways to <laughs> make things change. But uh... So in 1994, just before the launch of ISO, CEA offered me a very high level position and I felt really that I was breaking the glass ceiling. You all know about the glass, the glass ceiling. It's a metaphor often used to describe invisible barriers through which women can see elite positions but cannot reach them. So the CEO offered me to become the director of basic research, physics, chemistry and geosciences, about 3000 people. I held this job for five years while working on ISOCAM, where I met my team in the evening and we stayed late at night eating pizza. Um, and until last year, I was the only woman to have reached this level at CEA. But now they put a woman there with a job, I must say, higher level than I have. In 1999, I took a leave from CEA to become Director General of ISO. And uh, I was the first woman to run one of the European research organizations. But since 2017, Fabiola Gianotti is the CERN VG. So in parallel, in 2006, I became the first woman president of the IAU. Now there, after that, several women succeeded me, including the incumbent, Evin Van And then in 2009, I became the first uh, and only woman to be high commissioner in the French system. OK. So I went to ISO. And with this, I went from space to ground telescopes. And these are the telescopes I have been uh, involved in, mostly, <laughs> a little bit in others. So from 1999 to 2007, I was the Director General of ISO, headquarters in Munich, observatories in the Atacama Desert in Chile. And I arrived uh, uh, just as the VLT Observatory had been uh, inaugurated by my predecessor, Ricardo Giacconi with only one telescope and two instruments. And of course, we had to go to four telescopes and the four instruments on each telescope. So a lot remained to be done. I supervised the end of the construction, the start of operations. And uh, the Paranal Observatory, I said, had become one of the prime observatories in the world. And if you look at ESO on uh, internet, you will see that they present themselves as the foremost optical observatory, and rightly so at the moment. So while I was at ESO, I supervised the studies and the first part of the construction of a new worldwide facility in submillimeter and millimeter wave astronomy, ALMA, throughout my mandate as ESO DG. 
So Alma has been lived at an altitude of 5,000 meters in the Atacama Desert, you know, in a, quite separate from the, um, from the VLT, from Paranal. In 2003, I signed an agreement with the head of NSF and later with the Japanese and AOJ to construct Alma. It was inaugurated in 2013 after I was gone. And uh, the astronomers among you know that it's a fantastic success and a revolution in astronomy. I give an example of uh, a protoplanetary disk around a young star showing the regions in which planets are being formed in this protoplanetary disk, creating holes in the disk. Uh, while I was at ESO, whoop, no way. I also supervised the launch, I rather launched the studies of what was going to be the next ESO large project, the 39 meter European Extremely Large Telescope, whose construction is ongoing. I encouraged the excellent optical engineers who develop a new concept of a telescope with five mirrors instead of the usual three, with the idea of constructing the, uh, no, I guess I have already said, so the fourth and fifth mirrors are flat and they provide adaptive optic corrections for atmospheric distortions and tip tilt corrections for image stabilization. While in the other telescopes, this is done by instruments separately. So uh, the, this telescope has a surface of 1,000 square meters to compare, for instance, to JWST 25 square meters, which is, uh, in fact, the, the closest competition. They both will do a lot in infrared but it can have uh, an accuracy uh, resolution of 5 milliard, sec milliard seconds compared to the 34 milliard seconds of the JWST. And uh, this is the surface covered by the big telescopes all over the world. And this is that of the ELT. So you see ELT alone has more surface than all the other telescopes. <clears throat> In 2006, I became president of the IAU, just in the middle of the big drama about the motion of Pluto from planet to dwarf planet. So uh, I had to face <laughs> um, journalists from all over the world and uh, al also some of our colleagues were not happy. Very interesting. But I must say, I think we did well in doing that. I'm all in favor of this new denomination. And in 2009, I was at the driver's seat for the worldwide celebration of the International Year of Astronomer. I'm sure you all remember with this motto, the universe yours to discover, which was a celebration all over the world, uh, which really uh, was seen by millions and millions of people. So that leads us to about 2010 or later. And this decade, what I did is much advisory work, uh, uh, such as uh, chair of the high level council on large research infrastructures in France, which I did for seven years. I got involved with the CERN council and was even vice president for a while. I was chair of these as senior survey committee to select the teams for the large missions L2 and L3. And I was uh, chair of the Space Science Advisory Committee for three years. And then, surprise, in 2017, I got a phone call to ask me whether I was interested in becoming the chair of the SKA Board of Directors. And uh, I don't know at all how I'm doing with time with uh, William. Uh, I think I'm probably passing or? You're fine, you're fine, Catherine. It's OK. That's fine. Good. So uh, I accepted and it brought me, you can see, I, I didn't tell you, but in Argentina, after I finished uh, my studies, I worked for a while on the construction of a radio telescope. And I also did a bit of radio astronomy apart from, to, which I didn't tell you here. I mean, obviously I <laughs> can't tell you all my life, but uh, it was very interesting. Uh, so at this stage in my life to go back to radio astronomy to complete optical infrared, uh, uh, and then high energy gamma rays, X-rays, et cetera. I have been involved in all of this back to radio. So uh, I was uh, very, very convinced by the science case of SKA, which is really broad and 
fantastic. And so I accepted and I chaired the SKA board from October 2017 to January 2021. And then last week I was elected chairperson of the SKA Observatory Council. So this is the first meeting of the that we had last week. So you see I'm here and Phil Diamond, Director General is here and then people from all over the world. So what is SKA? Probably most of the people looking this uh, know already that uh, it's uh, the biggest, uh, it will be the biggest radio telescope in the world by far, very ambitious project with a part that the low frequencies uh, built uh, in uh, Australia and the part that the higher frequencies built in South Africa. So I think I won't describe it here to this audience. I'm using slides that you know. And the headquarters are in Jodor Blanc. But they are already re ready and we have even been using them with the board. And I show you the beautiful council chamber where we should have been sitting last week, but unfortunately we couldn't. But we are looking forward to sitting there in the coming years. So as I said, SKA has a very, very wide range of uh, possibilities of science opens in every direction. And this is all well organized. Uh, huge books have been written separating it in subjects such as cosmic, cosmic dawn and epoch of reionization, cosmology, galaxy evolution, cosmic magnetism, fundamental physics, Francian sky, cradle of life. And you can see, of course, a connection with many of the topics here with things that I have been involved in in my life, so you could see why I'm so interested. Uh, here I just spent a very short time on the one on galaxy evolution, because you see a very strong connection with the work that in my group was started, Science Twice Ocam, and then uh, was followed with the other um, infrared satellites, uh, Spitzer and in particular Herschel, where my group was very much involved also in uh, building uh, hardware. And of course now with ALMA and other facilities. And so uh, what is found is that galaxies have very uh, short uh, gas consumption times. They consume the gas by making stars. So you need some replenishment. Some gas must be falling in. And it's, of course, very interesting to try to see it in H1. And who can try to see this? SKA. So, and uh, similar, very interesting things can be done at the level of clusters of galaxies. Actually, already planned surveys will find thousands of clusters at redshifts of two or three, you know, far away clusters, and uh, perhaps be able to see how uh, the, these clusters, how gas is uh, um, moving in these clusters. And this would be extremely complementary to uh, UCLI, the satellite that will be launched very soon by ESA to do cosmology, and by Athena, which is a very big uh, extra emission in preparation by ESA as well. So as I said, there would be access of uh, the flow of coal gas to the large scale structure. And we are very much uh, looking forward to continue the work on this subject with this data that can be acquired in the future with SKA. So, uh, well, this uh, by Emmanuel Daddy was like a summary of uh, the kind of work that SKA will allow on this subject. So I think we can look forward to the 2030s. And this is a slide from ESO. I mean, one could choose others, but this is what ESO has chosen to show as the future important facilities. And here you see uh, the, the way they will, uh, the sensitivity they will have at the various wavelengths. And of course, with the uh, SKA, you can see uh, gas uh, with ALMA, uh, Spike, etc. You would speak, unfortunately, has it appeared, it's gone now, but uh, etc. You can see starlight and dust, and with Athena, 
accretion. And uh, I'm very interested by this graph because of course here you see DLT, which I started, Alma, where Ario played a big role in the construction. CTA, uh, which does high energy gamma rays, uh, I'm involved in also uh, somewhat. Um, and uh, Athena and Liza were the two missions that were selected by the senior group, which I chaired for ESA. And I'm very much looking forward to see them being constructed and working. So this was about the science part. I thought I'd tell you something about statistics. So women at IAU at the moment, the percentage of women in the membership is 22.8%. So first of all, the IAU, the IAU International Astronomical Union doesn't try to get all the astronomers in the world. Each country selects the most distinguished set of astronomers to be IAU members. So that's the way it works. And so when you see this 22.8, you think it, even though presidents tend to be women these days, <laughs> it's a little bit discouraging. But actually, they uh, recently made this very interesting uh, uh, statistical study about the age range, which doesn't cover everybody because they didn't have the age for everybody. So it's limited, of course, to the people for whom they knew the age. But it's very interesting if you see I don't know why this, this is covered, unfortunately. But this is the percentage of, uh, this is the number of women, the number of men, percentage of women, percentage of men. And so between 95 and 100, <laughs> we have 11 men and one woman. So it's 8.3% women. As you go up, you have 10, 11, 13, 15, 17, 18. In the 55 to 60 range, it's 18%. In the 40 to 45, it's 30%. If you go to the young ones, of which they are few at the moment, but uh, now there is a big group of IAU uh, for young astronomers, and there you get 44.7. So you can see that uh, in astronomy, in the future, I think um, the diversity, at least in terms of uh, men and women, will be OK. So it's very nice to see that. So I thought I'd finish with some personal impressions on women in science and technology. And this is a little bit to give advice to young women and wondering whether to make a career there. So, and sometimes it becomes very personal, but uh, husband, companion, it's very important to choose well because it's important you don't necessarily need a man who is protective or even supportive with some condescension. You need an equal, respecting your choices and your career and prepared to accept your independence and even your success. And he knows that your career is as important as his own. I found that in my husband, Diego. Then children. I should have, I don't know how to not hide the top, never mind. So I thought children are not necessarily important for everybody, but uh, for me, they were essential. And uh, when I was given a position at Caltech, as I told you, I was intimated by the, the department head, told me in advance, came to see me at Harvard and told me, I don't believe in women in science, but you know, your thesis uh, was so good that we decided to offer you a postdoc, but no babies when you come to Caltech. And uh, the first thing I did, I would say, I arrived in October and in November I was pregnant. So um, uh, fortunately I was able to continue my work there, but without the maternity leave and the heavy load, but the science was great. And as I told you earlier, I was happy. The second child I had in France in what, we consider now more normal circumstances. These days, it is becoming more and more accepted that women can have a career and children, and access to childcare facilities tends to improve everywhere. And even more than that, what I see now is that fathers' participation in raising young children is continuously increasing. You know, when I had my son, I think uh, the first son, Diego, never changed a diaper. I mean, it didn't even occur to me that he might change a diaper. 
So uh, the second he changed some diapers. And uh, my sons, so, so I had two sons, here they are as little, and this is the way they are now. And each of them has one child, so I have two grandchildren. And uh, they uh, took care of their children just the same as their, their wives. I'm happy to see that. So it may be that uh, I'm giving you here advice from an old woman and that you don't need anymore, I hope. Okay, mentoring. A lot is said about uh, women need mentors. And of course, for me, an important mentor was my CIS advisor from Princeton, Russell Kurz, who is now over 90 and still doing a lot of research. So I think that role models and male and female mentors can be a great help in launching and nurturing a career in science. But I think it's very important for a woman scientist not to depend too much on a single mentor, especially if the mentor is a man. And then you always look like, you know, somebody's little thing or project or whatever. I think it is best to lean on various persons that help you shape up your own personality. So I, I did not have just one mentor, a number of people. And uh, in fact, I mostly have been independent in my work. Oh, I don't know how to do to see the top of my own slides, but uh, I think it's very important to be ambitious, to nurture great expectations, to seek opportunities for making new developments or discoveries, for recognition and for promotion. It used to be said that young women exhibit a fear of academic success, which appears to increase as the student approaches for goal. I said it in the past, but I'm not completely sure that it's not still a bit true at the moment. Um, there is also this imposter syndrome, which attacks more women than men, which I myself, I must say, suffer from. So it is important to overcome this tendency at the individual level as early as possible. Even if you have it, forget it and continue. In my case, I certainly did not find my career as it turned out. At first, I saw myself as a theorist working alone in a corner with paper, pencil, computer. But I soon realized the need to be aggressive in order to be heard or even noticed. And I adapted to that need. Once in Europe, I developed a strong wish to see France and Europe get ahead in science. It is because I thought I knew what to do, thanks to my opportunities, in particular in the US, and because I was willing to take on responsibilities that I ended up taking big manage management jobs. But every time I have been offered a high position, it came as a complete surprise. I never planned it. I never tried to get it somehow. It got offered before I even thought about it. And then it's very important to have a passion for science, technology, engineering, or math. When they can set themselves free from pervasive stereotypes, women can, as well as men, exploit their talent to attempt to unravel the mysteries of nature or unleash their imagination and come up with original innovations. And then it becomes a passion. Personally, I have always had a passion for science in general, and actually I have very wide interests, and for astrophysics in particular, and it kept growing with time. And this has made my life exciting and fulfilling. And then what is important in the earlier years of the career of a woman scientist, and later also, by the way, to be able to say no, not indiscriminately, but at the right time, on the right occasions. No to second grade situations. No to meddling in your personal life. No to always being second fiddle in a collaboration. No to a dominant partner. It still leaves you with many opportunities to say yes, and with the possibility of a happy, fulfilling life in science. Thank you very much. I think that's the last one, yes. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Catherine. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I think we can all give a, a round of applause. Thank you. Um, can you stop sharing your screen, uh, Catherine, so we yes, can see uh, you? Yeah, that's excellent. how I do it. So you had some very strong yes. you know, and important words in there. So, so I think that was really good. And, and, and thank you for such uh, honest, if you like, and quite intimate
talk, you know, at times as well. I think it was really, really important. It's also, I found it fascinating to see, you know, that over time, if you like, you can see how, the, you know, the situation has evolved as far as, you know, gender, uh, gender balanced uh, is concerned. I mean, so there's still a lot of work to do, obviously, but it's really, you know, it's, it's fascinating to see these early photos and the stats that you showed as well. I think it, it's great. And, uh, and yeah, I think your career, if you like, and your achievements uh, have, you know, really paved the way and are paving the way, uh, if you like, towards reaching gender balance overall. I, I will just say an anecdote just now, which uh, one of the colleagues in the chat box was saying to me that he was watching your talk just now with, a, with his daughter. And his daughter says, yeah, I want to be a scientist. Now. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so there you go. Oh, blood. <laughs> <laughs> it's the best I could hear. Absolutely. So that's that's great. I will uh, open up for questions. Uh, so if you want to raise your your virtual virtual hand uh, on Zoom, that would be great. Uh, I will just start with one uh, myself, if you don't mind. Um, do you think you you've got more influence, if you like, uh, in particular in you know in progressing this uh, diversity agenda? as a successful scientist or, you know, inspiring the next generation, basically, or in a, in a more political role, you know, with, or is it a mix of, of both, basically? I think it's mostly as a manager, third thing. In all the places where I was a manager, I took care of, the, of women, not, not the, just by trying to promote them ahead of men and things like that, that's not the way but just by helping them gain self-confidence, find a place, uh, become important. Uh, so I did that with many women. I think that's by far the most important thing I've done in this okay. year. Okay, thank you. So again, encouraging people to raise their hands. Uh, I, I'm looking at the chat box as well. We've got a question from uh, Manta Pomier in France. Uh, what advice do you give to institutions who always put mothers at second positions and how to improve the situation, especially in the French system. I know it's difficult. You know, I told you my second son, it was much easier. It was easier in the sense that for the first, I had even to pay, you know, the hospital because I had just moved and I didn't have insurance. So it, it, it cost me. In France, of course, it was free and the CEA gave me a bonus because I had had a child. And I could take a maternity leave, which was much too long for my taste. So I only took a little part of it. But when I came back, the director had put somebody else as head of the theory group saying, oh, now you will be too busy with two kids. So Thierry is going to do it much better. And uh, I shout. <laughs> so sure I didn't did. let it happen. I did not let it happen. And I took it back. And then sometime later anyway, he was tired and uh, left and I was the next <laughs> director of the whole group in this case. Sure. But, uh, Which required so a strong, strong personality basically to, you know. So I, I think indeed this happens all the time. I mean, I didn't expect it at all to happen in France. You know, when I came back, another head of the theory group, come on, you know, because I had a baby. Oh. So uh, it, indeed it happens. So how to make it not happen? Well, I think fortunately uh, much more is being said these days everywhere about the importance of uh, sharing the sky. So uh, it should happen less and less. But if it happens to you, it, it's, it is no that I said at the end. If they want to put you in a second position, then don't take it. For years it was the president uh, is a man and the vice president is a woman. The head is a man and the second is a woman, etc., etc. I never accepted to be number two anywhere. Of course, I've been offered many times. Never. Very strong. Thank you. Um, a question from uh, Daniel Fenech, uh, Fenech, if you want to. Yeah, yeah Fenech. Yeah. Hi. Um, so I would actually just a question about one of your last slides and the, and the discussions about um, workload and, and saying no to things. And I think there's very much a perception, um, you know, I can speak from my own experience, but also other people I've discussed with, um, that, you know, if you, if, you, if you say no, you can't be relied on, people won't come back and ask you again. And, and essentially you kind of vote yourself out of, of being involved in things. 
Um, I'd be curious to know what your personal experience on that has been. Has has there been times where you feel like you've you've turned something down and and regretted it? And and how do you distinguish that from the things where you where you said yeah um you said no and actually came come out the other side thinking that was a really good decision to say no no there's no time that i've said no and that i have regretted i took a big risk at cea as i said i was head of astrophysics the next level was astrophysics plus particle physics plus nuclear physics from together a big group and when i decided to stop being head of astrophysics, I was offered to be at this next stage. Now, this stage is a lot of work and uh, not so much power because the power, when you are head of astrophysics, yes, be okay. When you are at the top, yes. And the people in between, it looks like a nice title, but it's not so big. And I was interested in ISOCAM. And so I said, no. And I thought, I will never again be offered something at CEA. And a few months later, they gave me the top job. What can you do? Yeah. Thank you. I hope it answers your question. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, we've got Sherry, Sherry Breen. Hi. Um, thanks for the great talk, Catherine. I think it was really amazing to hear about your career. And thanks especially for the openness. I mean, that was really great. Um, you gave a lot of tips there at the end for women, which I think a lot of us um, needed to hear um, and, and can put into practice. But what about the tips for the men? I mean, this gender diversity is not a women's issue. It's, a, it's an everyone issue. So I just wondered if you had any, anything to say to them. That they should not consider women any different from men in, in their everyday work. You know, I, and the, I have the impression it is changing. Perhaps I'm too optimistic, but uh, at least, uh, you know, I go a lot to the discussions in my group, there's groups of, and uh, there's a lot of young postdocs and so on. And I don't have the impression it's any different between the, the men and the women. And also that the men on top don't treat them differently, but perhaps I'm wrong. Well, let me tell you, in my time, it was completely different. So I think uh, this idea of equality is coming, at least, I would say, in France, in my environment. Um, so the important thing is, you know, on the one hand, there is the gender, and on the other hand, there is the working relationship. And these are two different things, period. Never miss them. Thank you. Um, got a, a question in the chat box from uh, the daughter of one of our participants. Uh, she's asking, what are you hoping to achieve uh, with the SKA uh, project? Well, I'm extremely excited to be at this time. It's, uh, I'm sure uh, Phil, Simon, I think are there and others. Uh, Antonio, I see, I mean, you know, I see a few of you. <laughs> I'm sure everybody is just, uh, involved in the project at the moment, Colin is as excited as I am, because uh, we hope that uh, it will be possible to start construction this year. So imagine how exciting. So there is, of course, the, the interest of thinking what it will be when it is finished, what can be done, and so on, which I tried to say a few words about, and which each one can apply to his own field of scientific interest. But uh, I also like the fantastic adventure, as you can see from my experience, of building in an international setting, in an international group, getting all to together and building a completely new instrument and bringing the know-how from, you know, there are 16 countries involved, each one bringing what they know, what they can do, and all this together to these deserts in, uh, Australia and South Africa, it completely fires my imagination. It does. I've got a, I don't see any more hands actually. Um, just a question for me. Are you missing, I know I asked you that question before, but are you missing doing science, uh, Catherine, at all? Or? Am I missing what? 
doing science yourself? I cannot say I'm not doing science. Uh, what I miss, I'm missing uh, being close in at home, like all of you. I mean, I'm, I'm missing going to Saclay. Um, a lot is going on in Saclay. I still have an office there. I can go to meetings, discussions on many, many different topics. I see the people doing it. I read quite a bit. Uh, I am not at all far from science. Okay, I'm conscious of time and I see just one last hand from Fiona. So I will give you the floor, Fiona, for the last question to Catherine. Um, thanks very much, Catherine. I thought your talk was really interesting. So thank you for that. Um, I wanted to ask you, um, what do you think are the key things organizations that you've worked for have done, which have really helped you the most as you've developed your career? And do you think there's any learnings from that that we can take on board for SKA Observatory? What do I think exactly? I didn't completely understand the question. Oh, sorry. What, what, what I suppose it's just thinking about, you know, from your experience of other organizations, are there any key things those organizations have done which have really helped you develop your career? And can we learn from that in, in SKA? It's difficult to say. Well, uh, um, at least. Uh, they have, uh, I would say, neither as a postdoc nor later. I never had anybody telling me, this is what you need to do. Uh, I've always been in situations where I could be the one to say, this is what I wish to do. And I think this is essential. Not to be told what to do, but to be asked what you should do. And in terms of employment, Fiona, since it's you, I think uh, the very important thing is, and this is more not for, my, for me, but me as a manager, um, it's not that you make little boxes where you say, I need a person who will do this, 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 and then a person who will do this, 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 and then you assign this to the people, and this is what they do. But you get to know the people, you get to know what they can do well, and then you change the job descriptions according to the possibilities of the people. And if you, that, if you do that, then everybody's at his top or her top mm -hmm. and everybody's happy and you get a lot more. So I think that in terms of uh, dealing with personnel, that is the most important thing. And I must say in CEA in particular, it's the kind of place where people enter and never leave. So mm -hmm. these are the people you have to deal with. So it's very important to make them have fulfilling careers in accord with their capacities. And personally, I'm fascinated by that. I always put a, letter, a lot of effort into that. Thank you. Great, thank you, Catherine. I said it was the last one, but actually I missed, I missed one question on the chat box, apparently from Anita Richards. I, um, I can reformulate it for you, Anita, if you want to, to ask, ask it yourself. I don't know if you're still on, on the line. Okay, I, I, I'll just uh, very quickly summarize the question. I mean, thank you very much again to, to Catherine for uh, her many, many talks from you and all, <coughs> all very inspiring and the importance of role models is, is really great. One thing I've noticed, particularly in the British system, is that a lot of postdocs who go into being um, uh, observatory staff, maybe part-time research, are at a huge disadvantage when it comes to applying for fellowships and things. Um, ditto people who are in large collaborations. Um, do, do you have any comments on how we can put that right? No, I wish I knew. I mean, it, it is indeed a problem that worries me very much. Um, it's been worrisome uh, all the time, but it doesn't improve. And uh, the, the only thing I can say, and it's of course not so true at the level of postdoc, but for graduate students, it's important to know that uh, career in astronomy can also open new possibilities for other fields and that it's not, sometimes it's not so bad if you do that. So always, uh, be sure that you have a, um, that you know all your possibilities and you can see what's happening in the world and see 
if the opportunities astronomy offer you are such that you want to stay or you want to get out. But I think you have to, to keep this open and also realize uh, how much you would make, what your life would do if you were elsewhere, if we're accepting something that you don't like so much because it's in astronomy. But uh, I, I'm saying that with a heavy, ha with a heavy heart. <laughs> so, so I don't know. I think, uh, I think it is difficult. Right. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, I think we can uh, wrap this up. Uh, again, uh, a big you know, round of applause to you uh, for such a great talk. Thank you very much. Thanks for being so, you know, so open uh, with, uh, with us today, uh, for sharing your journey as a woman in science uh, all these years. Um, that's been really, really inspiring for, for all of us, uh, I'm sure. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, and again, I mean, we, we are very privileged to have you as a, you know, the, the first chair of our observatory. That's, that's, that's excellent. So, well, looking forward to, uh, you know, other opportunities. And uh, thank you all for, for being here today with us. And the SKO Speaker Series will continue in, uh, in the future.